I am honored, uh, deeply humbled, as convener of the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, to open this forum and reception as the official launch by the coalition of a year of commemoration and forums during the 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. The world international legal order in 2018 does not reflect the geopolitical situation of 1998 or 2002 at entry into force or 2003 when the governments elected the first 18 judges. We are indeed in much more perilous times. Foreign policy elites, like uh, last week the President of the United States Council on Foreign Policy, are stating that the UN international laws and organizations uh, can, quote, play, if any, a most limited of roles, given the resurgence of great power rivalry and dangerous regional states and ISIS-like terrorist entities and movements. I think this institution and this treaty organization and body is a complete contradiction of that view, and it was uh, 20 years ago uh, in July when those governments uh, voted 120 to 7 to adopt the Rome Statute of the ICC. It cannot be denied that the world is confronted with very serious dangerous threats of war, religious conflict, extreme nationalism, xenophobia. The coalition's goal in promoting a year of commemorations and stock taking of the Rome Statute, the ICC, and international justice to look backwards and forwards at the historic developments in international justice during the last 20 years. It is not to be a year of self-congratulations and looking back, but a year of diagnosis and reaffirmation to progress, moving from years of having to be on the defensive to years of moving forward. It is not, I believe, self-congratulatory to argue that the, the adoption and ratification of the Rome Statute between 1998 and 2002 was one of the greatest advancements of international law in history, an advancement of international humanitarian and human rights law. Combined with the establishment of the ad hoc and special tribunals, uh, the use of universal jurisdiction, and the establishment of this court in 2003 and 4, the decade beginning in 1994 was extraordinary. Unparalleled achievements in multilateralism and the rule of law. And at the at the international level, but also at the regional level, in the European Union, in the African Union, in the OAS, etc. In reviewing these achievements, the coalition's goal, beginning more than two years ago, was to use the 20th anniversary to confront the regressive developments and forces. Uh, Milan Kondra, uh, a famous European um, author said, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And to paraphrase, the struggle of humanity against disaster is a struggle of memory against forgetting. A major goal of the anniversary should be to remember what was achieved, how was it achieved, for the Rome statute, statute was a victory of the small and middle power states, mostly democracies, over the big powers and authoritarian governments. We wanted the anniversary events to be framed not by the skeptics and opponents of international justice in the ICC, who actually do not know the Rome Statute, but by the supporters of the Rome Statute and the court, and thus our first invitations were to those who were in Rome and in, and in the ratification, entry into force, and the UN preparatory commission, commission processes. And the first leaders of the ICC, who would know what was negotiated at great sacrifice and difficulty. Next, we invited import, important current leaders of the system, judges, prosecutors, assembly of state parties, coalition civil society experts, legal representatives, and journalists. The background of those of us participating uh, 
in these two days of events include the coalition members, of course, the International Criminal Court, the international organizations, governments, and especially the Assembly of State Parties, uh, states, academics, journalists. Uh, we have presidents, prosecutors, and judges from the ad hoc and special tribunals, from the International Court of Justice, from the European Union, and other international organizations from the host country, and the ICC advanced teams, and of course, the first ICC judges. We have Rome establishment, Rome and establishment uh, uh, leaders from all these sectors from 1995 to 2004. We have coalition members who are now working here at the ICC, coalition members uh, now who are government representatives, coalition members that are now with the European Union or the UN or the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, and we have coalition members here that uh, are now legal representatives in ICC trials. And then we have the 2004 to 2018 leaders and current diplomatic and other community representatives. We have uh, government lawyers who went to Rome to the ICC as judges or went from Rome to the ICC as judges in, and staff in all uh, organs and at all levels, including uh, President uh, Fernandez. So it is an extraordinary and diverse gathering of true experts on the Rome Statute, the ICC, and international justice. I know our sequence of invitations was confusing to some, and I know we've missed uh, inviting some key actors and with our regrets. but. We are pleased to share uh, some memories and messages and written videos from many who were not able to join us today, uh, including former President Kears, uh, CICC Advisory Board Chairman Richard Goldstone, Roy Lee, uh, Judge Daniel Insereco, and others. And we have best wishes uh, from Adrian Boss, who led the process to Rome. We hope uh, our commemorations can honor those who contributed so much who have died. Uh, Sharif Bassioni, Hans-Peter Kahl, uh, Christopher Hall, Obi Nwenko from Nigeria, and many, many others that we have lost in these last several years. Today our opening forum includes presentations for all of the leaders and sectors that I mentioned. And if there is time, to receive a few interventions from the, pro from the participants. The program today and tomorrow at the Peace Palace strives to be simple but comprehensive. What is the historic significance of the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court? Assessing the Rome Statute system 20 years out, and third, the future of the Rome Statute system, the ICC and international justice. The concept note and the key discussion points in the program are to guide our commemoration and forums. A special departure or a specific departure from most meetings uh, uh, like this, this launch is, is that we are going to ask all speakers and presenters to limit statements and comments to five minutes so that two-thirds of the three sessions at the, at, at the Peace Palace will be devoted to interventions from participants. These are to be limited to one, or, one to three minutes. So we will need to uh, ask people to address one or two issues or discussion points very succinctly. And again, the goal was to in, instead of having uh, a few speakers cover many issues, we were hoping to have many participants each focus on one or two issues. We hope, uh, incidentally, that you will take your, your, the programs uh, with you uh, for tomorrow's sessions. And lastly, uh, we want to, President uh, Fernandez and the court's willingness to host the launch and your attendance have already, we believe, helped achieve a primary goal of the coalition, to inspire the court, the Assembly of State Parties, and coalition members to organize 20th anniversary events throughout 2018, to raise awareness of this historic treaty and organization, and to commit to taking strides towards universal ratification and cooperation, to replacing war and impunity for mass violence and repression with justice and the rule of law. Uh, now I'm honored to introduce uh, the president of the International uh, 
criminal court, uh, Sylvia Fernandez de Gramendi. Uh, Sylvia was at the very first meeting of the coalition on February 10th, 1995, as a legal advisor in the Sixth Committee, and I think rapporteur of the Sixth Committee, and has been in so many roles that we wouldn't have time for the, in this whole session to mention it, but has been, I think, one of the great uh, strengths and, and uh, leaders uh, in the world community for international justice, uh, President Fernandez. Thank you, Mr. Pace. Thank you, Bill. I would like to start by welcoming everyone to the International Criminal Court. It is a great honor for the court to host this event organized by the Coalition for the ICC. It is a great pleasure for me personally to have this incredible opportunity to receive at the seat of the court so many of those very same people who worked so hard to make the court possible. Now you have come from different parts of the world, some of you from far away, to see the realization of a great idea. A realization that was possible thanks to the energy and optimism of many individuals representing states and civil society in the road that led to Rome and ultimately to The Hague. It is truly fantastic to be able to have this remarkable reunion at the seat of the court thanks to the great initiative, yet another one, of the Coalition for the ICC, and I would say thanks to, in particular to the determination of Bill Pace. We hope to see a series of, the, of events to mark the 20th anniversary of what is one of the biggest achievements of recent decades to advance the rule of law a revolution, according to some. It is, however, indeed fitting that the very first event to celebrate it is organized by civil society, which played then and continues to play today a crucial and indispensable role in the making of the International Criminal Court. This reunion provides an opportunity for reflection and I look forward to listening to all of you on what we see today and how we envisage the future. What do we expect to see in 20 years' time? Most importantly, how can we ensure that this institution in which we have invested so much effort continues to grow and thrive? We all know that we are entering a more turbulent world of rising nationalism and intolerance, in which the international movement for accountability, human rights, and the rule of law will need to resist the risk of serious pushback. Multilateralism, which made this court possible, is under threat. I truly believe that what made this court a reality 20 years ago will also protect it in the years ahead. The key for me lies in renewing the alliance that created the court in the first place with its powerful synergy. This is the alliance of states and civil society. This alliance of the Rome times must be renewed, but taking into account the huge change that has taken place since then. The court is now a reality. It exists, it is working, it has matured, and it is delivering. So, this successful alliance of the past has now three pillars instead of two. And this fundamentally changes the dynamics of the work that lies ahead. In the next 20 years, we don't have to create a new institution, but we must together protect the independence of the court and cooperate fully with its activities so that it can investigate, arrest, and deliver high quality justice. We must together ensure that the court engages sufficiently the victims and communities affected by the crimes so they can understand, participate in, and develop ownership of its proceedings. Together, the court, civil society, and states must ensure that sound reparation schemes are put in place that provide appropriate compensation to victims for the harm suffered 
in an expeditious and cost-effective manner. Last but not least, we must work together to maintain and enhance the membership in the Rome Statute. The court was created as a last resort, complementary institution intended to serve as a backup to the failure of others to investigate and prosecute the gravest crimes that affect the international conscience. In order to be an effective and credible backup, the court needs to be able to step in in all situations of crimes in an equal and non-discriminatory manner. International justice cannot be selective. Our global court needs to become universal. There are great challenges ahead, but seeing you all here, I am confident that the energy and stubborn optimism of the Rome generation is still with us and will continue to inspire this enlarged alliance for the future. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, the prosecutor of the International uh, Criminal Court, Fatou bin Sudan. Uh, 20 years ago, of course, we would have had uh, very, very few people who had experience in international criminal justice. Now we have uh, individuals who have been serving in international criminal justice for more than 25 years. That's an extraordinary difference, and it represents tens of thousands of individuals. Uh, Prosecutor Bin Suda is one of those who uh, left the Gambia and uh, began working with the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, became the deputy prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, and for the last uh, seven years, I think, has been the uh, chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and a person that the coalition has enjoyed uh, uh, excellent uh, relations. Uh, we, as with all of the aspects of the court, don't, our members don't agree on everything, but what we have in, in the prosecutor is a person who has the highest uh, principles of the, of the statute that she is trying to help serve uh, for two. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it, give me, it gives me distinct pleasure to address you today at the CICC commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute. At the outset, I would like to extend my warmest congratulations to the Coalition for the ICC and its tireless members across the globe and express my deep gratitude for their work and dedication in contributing to the ever-evolving international criminal justice system in which the court stands as a crucial pillar. I also wish to thank Bill Pace for his personal commitment throughout the years and for today's gathering. I am grateful for this occasion to be standing before all of you as we reflect on that historic achievement in 1998, and as we look forward to all the opportunities and potentials for change that the future holds. Since joining the court in 2004, I have been privileged to witness the visions of generations of people transform from a theoretical construct to reality. We easily forget that just over 20 years ago, to many, it was inconceivable that a permanent international criminal court would materialize. As I often remark, the creation of the ICC must surely be one of humanity's proudest moments. Today, we see a court that is fast maturing despite formidable challenges and dispenses justice wherever it has jurisdiction, not least by slowly challenging the notion of atrocities as merely politics by other means. 
That archaic paradigm is slowly making that necessary shift towards a more rule-based global order. We are not there by any means, but the velocity of change has been fixed towards a more just and enlightened path for humanity. We cannot take for granted that we have what we have accomplished thus far. From words on paper, the court now produces concrete results through its work and ultimately by providing reparations to the victims of Rome Statute crimes. As we celebrate what has been achieved, we must consistently aim to set the bar higher. We, all in our respective roles within the international criminal justice system, shoulder great responsibilities. Through our collective efforts and resolve, we must ensure that the promise of the Rome Statute and never again don't ring hollow, but rather through the effective and efficient exercise of our functions and through tangible results, we give breath to the potential of the Rome Statute to make our world less ruthless and more just. Certainly, the court is headed towards new challenges as our activities intensify, whether in number, complexity, or geographical scope. I am proud to say that my office in the past years continuously prepares for these obstacles. We have streamlined our strategies, our policies, and management practices towards this end, learning from past experiences. Support for the court remains crucial. Cooperation efforts need to amplify in order to secure long-term gains for justice. The judicial machinery cannot be held in abeyance by lack of arrests. The court, with its growing reach and activities, coupled with ever-increasing calls for justice and accountability, needs to be equipped, including with the provision of adequate resources to implement its mandate as intended by the Rome Statute. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this timely forum provides a platform for constructive dialogue so as to engage and reflect on how we may further strengthen and promote the Rome Statute system. The course of international criminal justice has been implanted in our consciousness and it is a reality. There is no going back in this forward march towards uh, humanity, of, forward march of humanity. I want to thank you again, Bill, and all the other organizers who have made this event possible. And indeed, all of you, for all you have done and what you continue to do. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Fatou, I appreciate it. We have uh, on your seats, or at the back of the room, are both uh, a message from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. In his message, he ends it with saying, this anniversary offers an opportunity to reflect on the importance of justice in maintaining international peace and security and defending international human rights. Only when perpetrators of grave crimes are prosecuted and held to account can there be any hope that future atrocities will be prevented and peace preserved. People across the world have placed their hopes in the court and we must do all we must all do our utmost to enable the court to perform its vital work. Uh, now we will hear from the former Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Kofi Annan, who was so instrumental in the UN's uh, being able to help achieve the adoption of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dear friends, I'm sorry that I cannot be with you in person today, but I want to thank the Coalition for the International Criminal Court 
for organizing this event to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute. The statute's adoption in 1998 was a momentous step forward in the quest for global justice, peace and the rule of law. But the long journey towards ending impunity for the gravest of crimes must go on. It has been my privilege to be a part of this journey, sharing the struggle with thousands of dedicated individuals around the world. But there are millions more who have been with us every step of the way, the victims whose right to justice is our motivation. When as Secretary General I opened the conference in Rome, I appealed to the delegates to proceed as if the eyes of the victims of past crimes and the potential victims of future ones are fixed firmly upon us. This anniversary is a time to remember how uncertain those last days of negotiations were. In the end, the vote was 120 yes and 7 no. The ratification by 66 governments in less than four years was extraordinary. Now we have 123 state parties and the court is engaged in 19 situations and examinations around the world. In the face of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, the default position of the international community is now accountability and not impunity. Speaking as an African, I am proud of the continent's contribution to the success of this endeavor. African countries and civil society were active and progressive players in the creation of the ICC. Today, Africa remains the largest regional bloc of state parties to the Rome Statute. These are all remarkable achievements in pursuit of justice. But we must be aware that there remain enormous challenges confronting the Rome Statute system and the ICC. Hostility from states, the resistance of major powers to the cause, jurisdiction, and weakening commitment to multilateralism around the world pose a threat to the dream of justice for all. Strong political will allow the court to be born. If it is to continue for another 20 years and beyond, we will need leadership, unclouded vision, and steadfast courage. I encourage everyone, governments, international organizations, NGOs and individuals to use this anniversary to strengthen our resolve to end impunity, to enforce international law and to press all governments to join the court. Remember what prompted us to act. There must be no turning back, no slowing down in our journey. The voices of the victims call out to us from the past and the present. Their cry for justice must spare us on to our final destination. I'd like now to introduce another leader of the Rome Statute system, the current president of the Assembly of State Parties, who just began serving uh, uh, a month ago, or two months ago, I guess, at, at the middle of December. And he is the first time that a president of the Assembly of State Parties has been a judge of an international criminal court of the uh, uh, Yugoslav uh, Tribunal. Uh, so I'd like to, His Excellency, Mr. Ogon Kwan. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
It is an honor to be, for me to be here, and I wish to extend my gratitude to the Coalition for the ICC for organizing this great event. 20 years since the Rome Conference, the International Criminal Court has managed to consolidate, consolidate itself with the crucial support of the state's party and civil society as a fully fledged and leading international institution in the fight against impunity. The work of the court has contributed to the rule of law, the promotion of human rights, and ending impunity. As such, while international criminal justice may still be a project in progress, I believe that it has now become a significant part of the international legal order to ensure international peace and security. Nonetheless, the court still faces important internal and external challenges to, to its efficiency, effectiveness, and legitimacy. In this regard, we must recognize that although the court is the most visible part of what was established in 1998, there are other key factors or components of the Rome statute system, that is, cooperation and complementarity. These two important principles require the continued support of states parties, international organizations, and civil society. The principle of complementarity is the bedrock of the system and the primary responsibility for addressing Rome statute crimes rests with national jurisdictions. However, only half of the 123 states parties have adopted national implementing legislations necessary to ensure that they have the capacity to investigate and prosecute at the domestic level and cooperate with the court effectively. Moreover, the court remains bound by its treaty limitations and therefore is unable to address the mass international crimes that continue to be committed in the world. Delivering international criminal justice swiftly, fairly, and with quality is not the job the, the court can do on its own. The court requires the continued strong political and diplomatic support of the international community and the cooperation of states is indispensable in ensuring the ICC's effectiveness and to strengthen its credibility. The Rome statute system will definitely benefit from states using diplomatic dialogue with other states to promote cooperation between them as well as encourage ratification and full implementation of the Rome Statute. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the courts and states are not the only actors with, with roles to play. Civil society actors have been instrumental in, in promoting the establishment of and in helping to sustain the system of international criminal justice. In this regard, the CICC has not only proven to be a truly devoted and consistent partner of the court, but also an apologetic proponent and defender of the Rome statute system. We could not have managed without its support and constructive criticism. After the historical assembly session last December, where the activation of the jurisdiction of the court of the crime of aggression was adopted by consensus, I'm convinced that the Rome statute system has truly become an integral part of the system for securing international peace and justice. Further, I strongly believe that our common endeavor in the fight against humanity, I'm sorry, fight against impunity, should continue unrelenting in the pursuit of justice. Through the combined efforts and political will of states parties, 
the Assembly will continue to support the achievements of the goals of the Rome Statute. At this important juncture in history, the Court needs our support more than ever. It is my firm belief that in order for the Rome Statute to succeed, it is crucial to continue mobilizing state support to be more active in the efforts to fight impunity. In the end, the Rome Statute system can only as effective and efficient as we, states parties, together with the court and other stakeholders, make it through our actions and cooperation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next, uh, the coalition has uh, over 2,500 organizations that are members in 150 countries with uh, over 100 national or, uh, coalitions. Uh, we started with 25 in, in, at the meeting that I mentioned that the president attended in 1995. We had about 800 member organizations by the time of the plenipotentiary conference in Rome in uh, 1998. Uh, 530 or 40 NGO members of 300 of the member organizations attended the Rome conference and many for all uh, five weeks of the, of the meeting. Uh, and it is a coalition that has had the broadest uh, diversity of, of uh, thematic uh, expertise. Uh, the, one of our uh, best member organizations for all these years has been Redress, working with victims and, and Redress for victims. And we're very pleased to have uh, 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 Carla Firstman, who has been the director of uh, Redress for the last 17 years and has just completed her work, I'll be uh, the first NGO representative to uh, address us today. Carla. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be part of this celebration. The dream of establishing an international criminal court was realized 20 years ago, and it's the culmination of a much longer struggle for justice over the worst possible crimes. Justice is important for a number of key reasons. It's a framework for deterrence, to reaffirm a common set of values which recognizes these acts for what they are, which is international crimes, to establish a record of what happened, and to recognize the immense suffering of victims. It's been a great honor and pleasure to have been part of the civil society movement, which saw this court into creation, and which has followed the court's progress, its challenges, and its perseverance in its earliest phases, and again, once its docket of cases and its rich jurisprudence has begun to grow and develop. Civil society has been important supporters of the court, but also civil society has not held back in providing constructive inputs, feedback, along the way. Civil society's interest in the court stems from our deep understanding of the need for an independent vehicle of justice, a global voice which can rise above the politics, the conflicts, and simply focus on justice. Today, I see many faces who've been part of the ICC movement for justice since the early days. There's also some new faces, which really encourages in terms of the longevity and the continuation of our fights. Sadly, as Bill already mentioned, there are some notable gaps. And I can't help but think of Amnesty International's indefatigable champion of international justice, 
Christopher Keith Hall, who I hope is with us in spirit. At celebratory moments such as these, it's possible and natural that we pat ourselves on the back for the achievements and we ignore or put to one side all that there is still to do. The mandate of the course, we have to remember, is immense. Justice must become a universal battle and a universal value. Victims must see this court as a place where their concerns are not only heard, but addressed. I congratulate the court for all it has achieved, but I remind it, and I remind us all, this is a long and complex battle for international justice, and we all, all of us, must keep fighting. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce the man who was the deputy, I think, head of delegation for Jordan uh, at the Rome Statute of uh, uh, Negotiations in, in Rome. Uh, he was the first president of the Assembly of State Parties uh, and is now the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations. Uh, his Excellency uh, Zaid Rod Al Hussein. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, I am both delighted and honored to provide some brief reflections on this important occasion commemorating the 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute's historic adoption in 1998. I care very deeply for both the International Criminal Court as an institution and uh, the fight for accountability for horrific international crimes. I, along with many of the other individuals involved in the Rome Statute negotiations, hoped back in 1998 that the court would be progressively strengthened over time to allow it to serve its unique and essential role in the pursuit of justice for generations to come. Unfortunately, the last two decades have been wrought with challenges not only to the institution of the court itself, but also challenges undermining the general accountability regime for appalling international crimes that strike at the court's very reason for existence. Today, there are renewed threats by uh, some states to withdraw from the court. While one state has successfully completed its withdrawal, another state party reaffirmed its intention to abandon the court just two months ago. In addition, a Sudanese president, Omar al-Bashir, a fugitive from the court, uh, recently urged the African states to withdraw from the court if it does not meet the demands of some, but not all, African states. Uh, this is tantamount to holding the court hostage and an attempt to modify key provisions of the Rome Statute under the threat of withdrawal. The facade of so-called principles and legal reasons advanced in support of withdrawing from the court crumbles upon closer inspection. Uh, deserting the court results in granting de facto immunity to alleged perpetrators of international crimes. It promotes the voices of the few over the voices and needs of countless victims. It champions impunity over accountability and deterrence. It abandons victims in their hour of need. I believe that states taking this path are marching against the clear trajectory of history since Nuremberg toward a universal international order predicated on the ideals of international law, justice and the rule of law. 
They are simply on the wrong side of history, a history that I hope will continue to vindicate the principled and tireless efforts of everyone involved in the Rome Statute's adoption, its ratifications, the court's establishment, and its work to ensure that international norms are respected. The calls by some states to leave the court is not the only challenge it has faced, nor will it be the last. Uh, such calls are merely part of a larger systemic threat posed by the rising tide of isolationist, authoritarian, oppressive and unprincipled leadership to the global order based on multilateralism and a respect for international law. In such a world, unfortunately, the future challenges that the court will face and must overcome may be far greater than those of the last 20 years. To overcome the challenges of the future, our shared resolve to hold all perpetrators of international crimes accountable, regardless of their official position or nationality, must be maintained and even strengthened. Now is not the time for us to abandon the victims of horrendous international crimes. We must rather use the 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute to reaffirm our collective commitment to the principles of justice and the rule of law, principles that form the keystones of this court as an essential global institution. We must take this opportunity to renew our shared commitment to provide victims with the justice and remedy they deserve, including full and effective reparations for the unimaginable suffering they have endured. Despite all odds, we must also continue our mutual efforts to strengthen the court by, among other things, seeking universal ratification to the Rome Statute and continuing to expand the scope of the court's jurisdiction. In this context, the recent activation of the court's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression is a beacon of light. The activation underscores the progress that has been made since the adoption of the Rome Statute uh, 20 years ago, when negotiations over the crime of aggression nearly derailed the court's creation. Now, nearly uh, 72 years after Nuremberg, the court will finally have jurisdiction over a crime that, in the words of the judges at Nuremberg, and I quote, differs only from other war crimes, in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole." End quote. Firmly cementing Nuremberg's legacy, the court's newfound jurisdiction is a historic step that represents the international community's desire to shun war for peace. This positive development provides some measure of hope in a world seemingly filled with ever-growing strife. In the words of William Lord Garrison, a prominent American slavery abolitionist, we must not think, speak or write with moderation in the face of injustice. We must rather be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. We cannot equivocate, we can never excuse. We must not and will not retreat one single inch in our collective struggle on behalf of victims everywhere. Thank you. Uh, last night, uh, President Fernandez was receiving an award. She made an observation that the leaders uh, uh, like uh, uh, Zaid, uh, like so many that are in this room today, of the, the real workers and the ones who helped deliver this extraordinary treaty were relatively young legal advisors in the 1990s. And, and, uh, she, she, and her thought, which I think really deserves some of the consideration during this anniversary, was that that was one of the reasons why the negotiation was successful. 
is that they, they didn't come, that, that the older you got, the less optimistic you were that there would ever be an agreement in your lifetime for, for this type of a treaty or, or this type of in, an institution. Um, uh, I think our next uh, speaker is another principal of the International Criminal Court, uh, Herman von Hebel, who uh, we first met when he was an assistant to Adrian Boss in the uh, uh, four or five years leading up to the Rome uh, negotiations, and who uh, for then uh, went to work with other tribunals, uh, including in Sierra Leone, and has uh, for the last uh, five years served as the registrar of the International Criminal Court. Herman. Thank you, Bill. I take that as a compliment. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to thank the Coalition for the ICC for organizing this event to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Rome Statute. The CICC led the civil society effort that tirelessly campaigned for the adoption of the statute, and they have been a staunch supporter of the court ever since. In this, Bill Pace, as the CICC convener, has played a crucial role, and I would like to thank him personally for the many years dedicated to the cause of international criminal justice, and the ICC in particular. Many people present here today were also present 20 years ago in Rome, including myself. We've grown certainly older, and hopefully wiser. But the international environment has equally evolved. The political and economic optimism of the 1990s has unfortunately been replaced with political and economic skepticism. In all honesty, if the Rome Statute were to be negotiated today, we would probably not be able to achieve the same result as we did then. As such, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court is a most precious instrument that needs full support from states, from world leaders, from civil society, from academia, and all those who do believe in the court. Reflecting on those 20 years since the adoption of the Rome Statute, much has been achieved, but there is also no time to lean back. These are just, there are just too many challenges ahead of us. We need to increase the number of states' parties and continue our efforts towards universality of the statute. Only then can the court reach its full potential and be seen by the outside world as a credible institution dealing equally with atrocity crimes across the globe. We need to enhance cooperation with states. While cooperation with the court has been generally forthcoming, many arrest warrants are still outstanding which is the single most important impediment to the fulfillment of the court's mandate. We also need to continue to encourage more states to enter into agreements of voluntary cooperation with the court in order to facilitate the work of the court. And last, but certainly not least, we need to ensure that the voice of victims will continue to be heard and to be increasingly heard. Victim participation and reparations are unique uh, and cornerstone features of the Rome statute system. The success of the court will depend not only on its judgments and sentences for individuals who have committed the gravest crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. Rather, the success of the court will also, if not even to a greater extent, depend on giving the victims voice and adequate reparation and assistance in rebuilding their lives. A very pertinent example of this was when I met local religious and cultural leaders in Gulu, Uganda at the opening of the Ongwen trial in December 2016. Thanks to an intensive campaign of outreach, fears about what the court would stand for and possible impact on the peace process turned around into strong support for the work of the court, thereby leading to a feeling of ownership by the victims in relation to the ICC court proceedings. 
in a complex governance setting, such as the ICC, it is easy to lose sight of this bigger picture of why we are here. Let us be constantly aware in the ASP sessions, meetings of the Hague and New York working groups, meetings of the Committee on Budget and Finance, inter-organ meetings, and all others, that we are here, but we are all here to serve those whom the Rome Statute system was made to protect the victims. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the event. Well, thank you. I think every speaker uh, to this point has mentioned the important role and issue of the rights of victims in the Rome Statute and in this uh, mission to end impunity. Um, the Rome Statute has established uh, a very a unique uh, set of rights and, and roles for victims and created the trust fund for victims. Uh, we had hoped that uh, uh, we would be able to have uh, Mama Koti, one of the uh, members of the board of directors of the trust fund, to be with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, but that at the end was not uh, able to do so, but we are pleased that we have the chairman uh, of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims uh, to deliver a message by video, uh, Mr. Motu Noguchi. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor and pleasure to say a few words on this important occasion. One of the main characteristics of the Rome Statute is mainstreaming victims' rights in criminal proceedings. The Trust Fund for Victims was established directly by the Statute as a subsidiary body of the Assembly of the State's Parties. The role of civil society was critical in establishing the TFB as an essential element of the Rome Statute system. The TFB has been providing assistance to more than 400,000 victims since 2008 under the assistance mandate. As for the reparations mandate, so far the court issued three reparations orders in Dubanga, Katanga and Armadi cases. Last year we started the implementation of some of these cases for the first time in the history of the court. After 20 years from Rome, the statute's promise of reparative justice is finally becoming a reality for victims. Still, there are a lot of challenges. Relevant proceedings generally take too long from victims' point of views. The TFB's reach is limited, both in financial and human resources. Fragile security situations sometimes become an obstacle. To ensure that victims can regain their dignity and hope, and restart their lives as soon as possible, we have to establish a legally sound and operationally viable mechanism for victims. Whether the TFB can provide meaningful redress to victims in present and future cases largely depends on the level of support from the state's parties, which is the owner of the system. At present, the total three reparations orders amount to more than 13 million euros and this surpasses the reparations reserve in the TFB. There is clearly a need for radical increase of voluntary contributions. I'd like to request you to continue and further strengthen the support for the TFB. The Rome Statute's promise of reparative justice must be kept a reality for victims. Thank you for your attention. The uh, Rule of Law Peace Organization that I have had the great honor to serve as its executive director over the last uh, 23 years, and which has been greatly honored to be able to host the secretariats for the International Coalition. We, we had supported uh, an International Criminal Court for decades, and as at the late 80s were unfolding, we were very instrumental in advancing the UN decade of international law through the non-aligned movement. And 
at one of our meetings at the Church Center in New York on uh, th th these these issues, we had uh, this, I think, well, I don't know if he was the Swedish ambassador already, but he was certainly the director on international law work, uh, Hans Carell, and uh, Hans would then cross our paths when he became the Under Secretary General uh, uh, for Legal Affairs and the Legal Counsel to the United Nations and was the key person in charge of the negotiations uh, in Rome and so we are honored today to have Hans join us and to say a few words. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. Let me first thank Bill Pace and the Coalition for the International Criminal Court for the invitation to participate in this commemoration and to contribute these brief reflections. My memories from the 1998 Rome Conference are very positive indeed. As the representative of the Secretary General Kofi Annan, I was responsible for the organization of the conference together with my team from the Codification Division in the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs, led by then Roy S. Lee, the director of the division, and who became the executive secretary of the conference, and also Manush Asanjani, who fulfilled the important function as secretary of the Committee of the Whole. Let me first mention that we had an excellent cooperation with the host country, Italy, and the city of Rome. This was of tremendous importance since the five-week conference was intense and in need of all possible technical support. Let me also thank the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, which made a great contribution to the successful outcome in Rome. The manner in which the coalition coordinated the work of non-governmental organizations could actually serve as a model for the way in which civil society should act in order to effectively influence and support the work of international organizations. However, at the end of the day, the success of the Rome Conference was the result of the commitment and determination with which the participating states and those who represented them um, and who, who worked in Rome, how they acted in Rome. It was great to see the manner in which they engaged in their work and their search for solutions of the many questions on the table during the negotiations. This determination was also translated into the ratification process. The 60 ratifications required for the entry into force of the state statute were received by my office in record time with the result that the Rome Statute entered into force on the 1st of July 2002. The ceremony for the swearing in of the judges on the 11th of March 2003 was a great moment in the history of international criminal law. Today, the Rome Statute has 123 parties. Others may testify to the work in establishing the organs of the International Criminal Court and the first cases brought before the court. What I would like to focus on now is the future. My first observation here is that a properly functioning international criminal justice system is an absolute necessity in a globalizing world. As I've said in the past, imagine the situation in, at the national level if the criminal justice system suddenly didn't function in a district or in a region of the country. Would it then be possible to govern the country? Of course not. The same actually applies at the international level, and this will be increasingly apparent in the near future. Against this background, it is of crucial importance 
that the organs of the court and the assembly of states parties actually perform and that this is a precondition for a successful conduct of the work of the court. And I refer to my reflections in the past on the challenges for the ICC. My second observation in this context relates to the responsibility of the United Nations Security Council. It is absolutely necessary that the Council fulfills its functions under the UN Charter and the Rome Statute. I refer in particular to the important provision in Article 13b of the Statute, according to which the Security Council, acting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, can refer situations to the ICC prosecutor. What signal does it send if the Council ignores this provision when the whole world sees that the Council should act and apply this article? Furthermore, if the Council has referred a situation to the ICC prosecutor, what impression does it make if the Council does not act in consequence with such a reference? If the evidence leads the prosecutor to persons at the highest national level, the court must follow suit and order the state to transfer the persons in question to the ICC. This would simply be acting in consequence with the manner in which the Council operated when it established the International Criminal Tribunals in the 1990s. The performance of the UN Security Council for a successful result of the work of the ICC simply cannot be overemphasized. Ultimately, this is about the responsibility of states to respect the universal and indivisible core values and principle of the United Nations. Human rights, the rule of law, and democracy. As so clearly stated, in the declaration of the high-level meeting of the General Assembly on the rule of law at the national and international levels of the 24th of September 2012. A primary duty of the members of the most powerful organ of the United Nations must be to bow to their obligations in this respect. If they do, they will also be in a better position to prevent conflicts and violations of international criminal law. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, a woman who uh, has been a former judge of the International Criminal Court, of the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, and a member of the Coalition's uh, Advisory Board, Her, Her Excellency Navi Pillay. colleagues and esteemed guests, I am Navi Pillay, former judge at the ICC and ICTR and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. I address you today on behalf of the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability. and its partner foundation, the Wayomo Foundation. This momentous anniversary, the 20th for the Rome Statute, marks an important time for us to contemplate all that has been accomplished in the fight against impunity for serious international crimes in these 20 years and also all that remains to be achieved. 
The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court is the greatest single advance in the project of international criminal justice. Not only does it undergird all that the ICC does and achieves, since it came into force it has inspired lawyers and human rights adv advocates in all corners of the world. In India it has been used to help modernize definitions of international crimes in domestic legislation. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, it has been evoked to help to effectively prosecute sexual and gender-based violent crimes. The core definitions of crimes within the Rome Statute have been essentially copied and pasted within the statutes of the various hybrid courts. The Rome Statute resonates far beyond the walls of the ICC. It is a gold standard for which we should be proud. But we cannot rest on our laurels. Challenges remain. Some of the most fervent supporters of the ICC, including my native South Africa, have political leaders who are second-guessing their commitment to international criminal justice. Populism in other parts of the world threaten the values upon which international criminal justice and respect for human rights were built. We must do better to distinguish between the self-interested and the superficial criticisms of the ICC from the legitimate concerns that, if addressed, could help build a stronger court and Rome statute system. It is for this reason that I am proud to be a member of the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability. Only by listening to the valid concerns of countries and communities can a better system of accountability for international crimes be built. I also take this opportunity to acknowledge the impressive, consistent support of uh, from the civil society organization of Bill Pay, PACE and the CICC. I also welcome the court's jurisdiction on the crime of aggression which will be activated as of 17th July 2018. It is timely in light of the troubling conflicts that are ongoing right now. On this 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute, we must more than ever be prepared to defend the values that, that underpin the statute. International criminal justice is a project that is here to stay. The Rome Statute is here to stay. The ICC is here to stay. Let us muster the courage to entrench it, to protect it and to improve it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite one of the uh, original uh, members of the coalition at its founding meeting, one of the, I think, pillars of international criminal justice for the last uh, 20 plus years, uh, the director of the International Justice Program of Human Rights Watch, uh, Richard Dicker. Thank you, Bill. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, I want to begin by flagging, as Nave Pile just did for us, uh, the Rome Statute as a major advance in substantive criminal law. The statute sparked a wave of law reform across many countries, albeit not enough, uh, and a codification of crimes against humanity and war crimes in national law. The Rome Statute and its Elements of Crimes document defines in a more precise and progressive way the most grave crimes and takes international criminal law to new and important depths. But 
20 years after Rome, following a rough start-up period replete with missteps and lessons learned, the court today is functioning, as others have said, on a landscape that is much more difficult than the one it was created in and for. I submit that this different terrain makes the International Criminal Court more important than we would have ever imagined when we stumbled out of the food and agricultural organization building in the early hours of July 18th, 1998. And that is because the imperative to limit and then end impunity for mass slaughter of civilians, for the widespread use of rape as a weapon of war, for ethnic cleansing, the imperative that is expressed in the commitment of states that have ratified the statute for victims in the Central African Republic, in Libya, in Georgia, in Burundi, and possibly in Afghanistan. Those all being countries within this court's jurisdictional reach. In today's world, this court is the permanent address of criminal accountability through fair trials. It carries the hopes and aspirations of victims in those state party countries for justice. States and civil society organizations had the vision to create this absolutely necessary judicial institution but to do so and to continue its work, more is needed. Let us make no mistake about it. The more the court implements its mandate, the more desperate opponents of accountability will react against this institution, making support for arrests for witness relocation agreements, for strong supportive statements in multilateral fora, for assistance in tracking hidden assets, all the more important today. The court needs more resources to properly staff its investigations and examinations as we've heard taking place in 19 different countries today. It needs more resources to obtain timely results, to reach victims, to make its proceedings more efficient and explaining its proceedings to to, excuse me, the communities most affected by the crimes. Lastly, the ICC is more important today because of what this court is juxtaposed against. The ICC is sharply etched against an expanding zone of total impunity marked by egregious crimes that are beyond its jurisdictional reach from Syria, Iraq, Yemen, South Sudan, and most recently, Myanmar. The ICC is, of course, precluded from exercising jurisdiction over these crimes because of a failure of a few powerful states serving their own political interests and the fear uh, of accountability that some hold. As the institution that represents criminal justice, this court is even more crucial 
as the living manifestation of the international community's commitment to justice for victims. I want to conclude by saying that this anniversary, an anniversary year is framed by all these factors. And it is a moment for states' parties to publicly restate and pledge their commitment to the court in a new and turbulent world and actively and proudly assist the court with its tasks as well as to discuss in a frank way its needs for greater resourcing. Given the stakes involved, it's also a moment for court staff to push harder to ramp up their own levels of performance. With tremendous progress behind us and steep challenges ahead, we call on states, on court staff, on civil society organizations to make this anniversary year one of serious discussion to advance the work of this vitally necessary institution. Thank you. Uh, former uh, Under Secretary General uh, Carell mentioned that the coalition had been able to develop a consultative relationship in our roles in, in treaty drafting is consultation. That we were able to uh, develop a consultative relationship uh, within the General Assembly uh, preparatory process and at the treaty conference that was extraordinary for us and I think for the governments and for the United Nations. Uh, I don't know of any other network that my organization works in that has had such success in having national and local NGOs working with regional international NGOs, working with global international NGOs uh, seamlessly now for uh, 23, 24 years. And, and a great reason for that is because of the leaders of, of the treaty process of the UN, of, of Kofi and Hans and Roy Lee, of, uh, of, of international organizations that have uh, worked constructively with the coalition in giving us the kind of consultative political space that we need to be able uh, to do our work and in, in the field to try and deliver on the ground uh, the vast and diverse uh, services that we want to, to address. Uh, one of the institutions that I think has been uh, uh, a, a highlight of intergovernmental support for the Rome Statute and the ICC has been the European Union, and we are honored to have a message from uh, Federica Mogherini, the High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policies. Twenty years ago, world leaders gathered in my home city of Rome and finally ratified the statutes of the International Criminal Court. I remember the feeling that after Rwanda and the war in the Balkans, the world needed real change, something truly revolutionary. And the Rome Statute has brought that change. It has strengthened an idea of universal justice beyond power politics and geopolitical interests. It has made clear that justice is not an enemy of reconciliation, on the contrary. When the victims feel powerless, when crimes are met with impunity, reconciliation is much harder to achieve. Impunity creates mistrust. It often results in revenge and in new violence. Impunity is a great enemy of reconciliation. I see this in my daily job, in the work we do as European Union to support peace processes all around the world from the Balkans to Iraq or Colombia. Accountability. Accountability is essential to build the foundations for peace. 
And yet today, the system of international criminal justice is coming under increasing pressure. All too often, those who work for peace and partnership have their voices silenced. The idea that might makes right is once again gaining ground. And this only makes peace and reconciliation harder to achieve. More than ever, we need to demonstrate in practice our support to the court and the Rome Statute. In doing so, it is essential that we hold on to its principles, but also that we are ready to adapt when change is needed. Implementing the Rome Statute is a constant work in progress. We need to work together to increase the number of signatories to the Convention, striving towards universality. We must address the shortcomings and continue to invest in justice. You know you can count on the European Union's constant support to the Court. We will continue to be the point of reference for all those who work for justice and peace all around the world. The path that started in Rome 20 years ago has only just begun. Uh, thank you and, and, and for all, all of your uh, patience today. Our last uh, speaker is uh, a, a former uh, president of the Assembly of State Parties. Uh, our hope had been at one point that we could get the first three presidents of the Assembly together, uh, Zaid, Bruno Stagno, and Christian Winnevaser for our, uh, one of the panels. Um, they, they, I think, all represented uh, the best of that young diplomatic leadership that is responsible for us being here uh, today and, uh, and which is, has been indispensable. Uh, Ambassador Renovation and the coalition have cooperated in so many ways it is not, not uh, it's impossible to describe. It just, a few of them are the institution of uh, ambassador breakfast for the ICC, the informal ministerial network uh, for the ICC, the, uh, uh, the ACT group, which has uh, its accountability wing, which is, has a project on the uh, uh, refraining from misuse of the veto, uh, the code of conduct for the veto that has now 114 governments who have uh, subscribed to it. And it is, as uh, Hans indicated and others, until the Security Council uh, stops misusing its powers and the permanent members and, and assumes the full responsibility for maintaining peace and security, uh, we are in an extremely more perilous uh, uh, situation. Uh, Ambassador was also the chairman of the review conference in uh, 2010 and uh, and a leader, the leader really, of the effort to have the jurisdiction for the, the crime of aggression, which was historically agreed to at, I think, 3 a.m. in the morning on the 15th of, of December. So we're honored uh, to have you with us and uh, to be our last speaker today. So. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much, Bill. It's a, it's a privilege to, to be here and to offer a, a few very short uh, reflections at the, uh, at the end of this, uh, of this event. I was one of those people who were young in Rome. Um, but I'm still optimistic. Um, in, uh, in those 20 years, uh, I think it is safe to say that the court has established itself as an indispensable institution. But it's also a moment, I believe, to say that it's an institution that we should not take for granted. Others have talked uh, about the progress that the ICC and the Rome Statute reflect and that they have brought to national systems in the world. Today, it would be very difficult to think of the institutional landscape without the presence of the ICC in it. At the same time, it is, a, it is also a moment where support for multilateralism as a whole, in general, is weakening. And one of the first potential casualties of that certainly is this court. 
So this is a moment for us to not just celebrate the achievement, but really to stand up for this institution. Others have talked of the external threats to the court, and they certainly do exist. But I also believe that we have to look at ourselves as supporters of the court and think about what we can do better in support of this institution. We have given this court a mandate that includes jurisdiction over the most serious crimes under international law. And this court has a policy to go after those individuals that bear the greatest responsibility for these crimes. These people are powerful individuals. Some of them are political leaders. That means that this institution will always be under political attack. What we have seen is that very often those who criticize and attack the court do so with louder voices than those who support it. And this, I believe, is what we have to change. And this is where we can do and must do better. Part of our reflection today should also be that not every crime, not every atrocity crime committed in the world will end up before the court. This is not only not possible because we have not achieved universal ratification, it was also never intended to be the case. The ICC certainly encapsulates the idea, the ideal and the notion of international criminal justice and is the centerpiece of the fight against impunity. But it is not only it is not the only element in that fight. We have to make sure that in situations where the court is not able to exercise jurisdiction, there are other ways to ensure that there is accountability, that it is not enough for uh, a state to be able to say, I can exercise my veto in the Security Council, and that will ensure that there is no accountability in a particular situation. Universality, of course, is a key goal. We have now 123 states, which is slightly higher than the number of states that voted in favor of the adoption of the Rome Statute. We do believe that it is possible to get other states to join and to, to soon reach the threshold of 129, which I believe is a good mark as it reflects two-thirds of the membership of the United <coughs> Nations. And finally, of course, as others, I want to say a word about the activation of the court's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression that will take effect on the anniversary of the Rome Statute. When we agreed in Kampala in 2010 on the adoption of the Kampala Amendments and on the seven-year period that would have to elapse before activation was possible, we did, of course, not know that the moment to do so could not be better than it is. There is no more powerful statement in support of the rule of law at the international level than to give this court jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. This decision does not only complete the Rome Statute, it also complements the Charter of the United Nations, at the heart of which is the prohibition of the illegal use of force. So we very much look forward to the court's work on the crime of aggression. We do not necessarily expect there to be a large number of cases in the imminent future, but we do hope that the most immediate and strongest effect will be in what states do at a time when there are increased real threats of armed conflicts between states. I thank you very much.
Well, uh, thank you all very, very much. Um, I, th I think the uh, last speakers have made uh, the case uh, brilliantly. Uh, this is a great achievement in international law. It has tremendous threats against it. Uh, in this room are the 20 or 30 different kinds of representatives that I mentioned and sectors who are responsible for the achievement of the Rome Statute, the establishment of the court, and the shepherding of this court uh, through these last uh, 20 years. Uh, we need to have the youth of Rome and the youth of today combine over this next year to make certain that we can end up with a stronger Rome Statute system going forward. One of the things is to join uh, President Kwan and others in trying to succeed in getting more of the smaller states and the states that have not uh, ratified the treaty to ratify during this year or to get it started this year. Uh, we're only at February. That's the whole point of our, our goal, was to get started early. It's time to go home uh, to justice ministries, to foreign ministries, to academic institutions, to relevant international organizations, and to replicate this. and. Uh, sorry for the technical things with the videos, but the, when we had the experts do the videos, we had them do them in a way so that they were not just for today, but could be used uh, throughout the year. And so we will make sure that the technical glitches are, are fixed so that you, if you wish, want to uh, uh, take advantage of them and can do so. It is, it is really very true that an extremely small number of people understand the Rome Statute, much less the International Criminal Court. Whether it's parliamentarians, whether it's academic demissions, whether it's international law experts. And so we have a tremendous challenge, and yet the small community that exists for the Rome Statute system has created one of the greatest uh, opportunities for this century not to repeat the mistakes of the last century, which unfortunately for the last 18 years it has mostly done. So we should hope that we can uh, continue to work closely together. I cannot thank again uh, the president, uh, the registrar, or the prosecutor for uh, the kind of support that they have given uh, to the coalition for its work and, uh, and, and will willingness to host this uh, uh, this afternoon. and. And, and, and our reception. Uh, it is, I think, uh, I wish I could go through some of the names of the people in the audience here today that have been so instrumental, uh, but we will have a chance now to uh, raise a, our glasses together and toast each other. I look forward to your participation, as many of you as possible, at the Peace Palace sessions uh, tomorrow. There will be a much greater opportunity for our uh, interaction and intervention from the participants. And, and uh, again, I think this is one of those eras, one of those moments of achievement of humanity since World War II that is, offers the greatest hope for this planet, for the victims, for all of humanity for, for this century and perhaps the next century. So thank you all very, very much. And now I welcome you to the lobby for our reception.